To Know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. We continue our study on the Psalms. And today our study is on Psalm 24. And so I'm going to read this psalm to you. It's a psalm that was read annually as a way of celebrating the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem, but it's also a psalm that was read, oftentimes antiphonally, at the beginning of the first day of each week. And so I'll read from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Isn't that a beautiful psalm? A psalm that was used in their worship services. A psalm that would be sung. This psalm, I've not heard any music to it as far as choral music. I'm sure that there are some choral music out there. But I remember there was this Christian band called Petra. They had sung Christian music for 33 years, but no longer are a band that's together doing God's ministry that way. But I remember they had a song, Who is this King of Glory? And so as a youth, as I would be listening to this, they had a song based on, on Psalm 24. So it's Petra's song that always comes to mind as I think about uh, putting music to these words and worshiping. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. He is the King of Glory. And so as I think about what this psalm is, it's the people of God bringing the Ark of the Covenant, opening the gates of Jerusalem, that the Ark of the Covenant may come in. Now in ancient times, the cities had walls built around them for defense, for protection. And then there would be some gates that were built into these walls. And so the gates would have to open up for anybody to come in. And so what they are saying is that the King of Glory comes in. And comes in in the Ark of the Covenant, carried in by the priests. Now what was the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the Ark of the Covenant was this box made of acacia wood. And it was plated with gold. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were gold, or gold angel figurines, one on each side of this. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were, were the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. And here again, that's why it's the Ark of the Covenant. Because with Moses, God made a covenant with the people based on his laws. God gave the Ten Commandments as being his instruction to the people, saying that if you obey my commandments, you will live well in the land. But if you disobey my commandments, that cursed are you. And so when God freed his people 
Israel out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. He freed them going through the Red Sea. They were in the wilderness and then eventually into the promised land. But while they were in the wilderness, it was there that God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. To show, and here again, a covenant is an agreement that two people make with each other. There is a promise. There are promises that are exchanged. It's legally bound, and there's generally a symbol to the covenant. And so that's the way it was with God, is that God freed his people. He promises that I will always be with you. He promises to be faithful. And he gives the Ten Commandments as now being what the people are promising to say, we will uphold your commandments and we will follow your commandments in faithfulness and obedience to you. And so the ark was now the sign or the symbol of this covenant. And that the commandments were therein. And so the ark represented the presence of God. And so whenever the ark of the presence, or whenever the ark was present, they always felt that, they always knew that God was present. And they took a lot of strength and comfort from that. That God is in our midst. God is present. As we read at the very last verse, of Matthew chapter 28, or the very last verse of his gospel, Jesus says, and he promises, I will be with you always until the end of the age. And that God continues to be with us and that he is with us in the Holy Spirit. That's, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' spirit. That God continues to be a covenant maker and that God has given to us now the covenant in our Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus died for us and has arisen from the dead. And he has now given to us his life. But he calls us now to live and to walk by the Holy Spirit. That we live and walk in obedience to God. In how the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. And inspiring us. And calling us to, to live the Christian life each day. That God is a covenant maker. I think about marriage. You know, marriage is a good example of a covenant where a husband and a wife, they exchange their vows, their promises before God, before our congregation, and, bef and with each other. They are legally bound and that a marriage license is signed. And the wedding ring is a sign of that covenant. And so there was a time in the history of Israel, where the Philistines came in and defeated God's people, and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. And so the people were crushed because as the Ark of the Covenant was not with them, they felt as though God's presence was not with them. That God had abandoned them, that God had forsaken them, that they were defeated in battle, and that God's presence was no longer with them. But it was under King David that David was able, with his army, to defeat the Philistines and they were able to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. And that's what this celebration of the psalm is all about, is that the Ark of the Covenant has now returned. That the glory of God, that God's presence, is now, once again, in our midst. And so it's a time of great celebration, of jubilation. But I'll read from... Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. Now David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the Ark of the Covenant. So David went down and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Odom-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull 
and a fat and a fatted calf. David wearing a linen ephod, ephod danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And so David danced. There was singing. There was trumpets. This is a time to celebrate. The Lord's presence is in our midst. And that's the thing that we must always remember is that we gather together. We worship. We sing. We praise. This is a special time because we gather around our Lord's presence, celebrating His, holy, His holiness, His holy name. And so I read the first two verses from Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. I love this verse because it really tells a lot about stewardship. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We have to remind ourselves. You know, we go through our lives thinking, oh, I, I've been born and I live my life thinking that it's my life to live and I live in this world and that whatever I can get, that is mine. If I can get some land, that is my land. And if I have possessions, those are my possessions. And that's the thinking of most everybody. But as we read this verse, no. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God is the owner of everything. And we are the stewards. You know, God created everything. I mean, everything you see, God created. God has created you. God has created humanity. But from all living things, God has given to humanity a very special calling. A very special purpose in that we are to be the stewards of the earth, that we are to be the managers of all that God has given to us. And so as we come to worship, we are worshiping God because God is the creator of all things. And God has created all things to be in subject to him. That everything lives to the glory of God. That everything Praise is God. I mean, the beautiful flowers. I mean, that's a praise to God. As we hear the sounds and the calls of nature, that's a praise to God. The wind and the rain, the thunder, everything praises God. Everything lives according to God's plan, according to God's purpose, His design. according to his laws. But we, as humanity, we have separated ourselves from God and creation because, after all, we have sinned, and the original sin is to be God. We bought the law that, we bought the lie that Satan brought before us. Why obey God when you can be your own God? And so, with our human reasoning, we think, well, yeah, why obey God when we can be God? We can sit on the throne. And so that's the way we operate. You know, do we think of ourselves as being part of creation? Or do we think of, you know, humanity and creation? Or humanity versus creation? In, in the way that humanity is going, we see that we're not being caretakers of the earth, but instead we are using the earth and we're not being sensitive to the whole ecological system. We're not being sensitive to the animal kingdom. We're not being sensitive to all of what God has created for us because after all, the world is the life support system that God has given to us that sustains life for us. So if we pollute the water and pollute the air and the soil in such a way, well, pretty soon, guess what? Humanity is not going to be able to live in this world, much less all the other created order. If we destroy our atmosphere, if we consume all of the world's goods, if we waste 
What we're doing is destroying the very creation that God has placed us in to take care of. And so we have to stop thinking that we are the owner of creation, but rather start treating creation in the delicate way of understanding that we are the caretakers of it. I once was living in a place where, they, where there was a mine. They were mining mainly copper. And the man who was the supervisor of the whole operation, and who was a member of the church, he once gave me a, gave me a tour of the mine. And one, and one of the things that he said, at least twice, if not three times, as he was in and amongst the workers, he would always say, let us remember that we are stewards of the earth. And the way that they went about this mining project is that they were able to extract the copper out of this mine, and then they reclaimed the land, to where today, if you went to where this mine was, you never would, if you didn't know that there was a mine there, you, would never, you, you wouldn't know that it had ever been there. And see, and that's the way that we want to live our lives in relationship to creation is that as we live in creation and as we use creation, that we are living it with that understanding that we are the stewards of the earth, that when we leave, when we depart from this earth, that the next generation, you know, wouldn't it be something that they would not even know that we were even here? We left it in that great of shape. And that's always the challenge of every generation is that we leave this creation in better shape than we found it. That is the goal. Understanding that, no, we haven't been placed in this world that we can consume the world so that we can, you know, just consume and overindulge for ourselves. Understanding that this creation is to be here for the many generations who will come after us and we need to be sensitive to them, just as the generations before us. I mean, as we look at time, just think of all the generations that have used this earth prior to our ever coming here. That there's a creation for us. And fortunately, five generations ago, that they didn't destroy all of creation to where we couldn't have life today. And so as we think of creation, as we come to worship, that God has blessed us, that everything that God, that everything about this creation is that God is the owner. And God has let us use his creation so that we can have life and that we can be stewards of it. But as we use creation, live in creation, that we must always take a percentage and offer it back to God in our, as part of our worship to continue the work of God in this world. You know, the biblical teaching is give 10% back so that God's kingdom, his church, can continue to operate in a strong way. But a lot of times we don't think that way. Why? Because we're, well, we're just selfish. You know, as if 90% of what we have isn't good enough for ourselves. We've got to take God's, we've got to take what we're to offer to God and know we're going to use that for ourselves as well. You know, and when we have that kind of an attitude, well, enough is never enough. But here again, who do we live for? Do we live for ourselves or do we live for God? Do we live by our selfish principles or do we live by God's principles? And a lot of it has to do with our attitude, you know, as to whether or not we see ourselves as being stewards of all of what God has given to us. And so I now read of verses uh, 3 through 6. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false? He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek your face, O God of Jacob. The holy hill. Who can ascend the holy hill? Now what 
hill is he referring to? He's referring to Mount Zion. That's the, the mount that Jerusalem was built on. Who, who can ascend there? Only those who are holy, who've got clean hands and a pure heart. Because here again, clean hands have to do with a pure heart. You know, if our heart is pure, then our hands are going to be serving God's goodness in life. If our lives are filled with sin, well, in selfishness, then our hands are going to be up to destructive things. And who is it that, you know, as far as false, those who are worshiping false gods. They are people of deceit. They are swearing by false gods. So in other words, they're not living in the truth. They are living a life of a lie. We think of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. God is a jealous God. We are to worship only the Lord our God. We're not to take the things of creation and make them into idols. We don't worship the created things. We worship the God who has created all things. And that's our, part of our sinful human nature is that we make, we make things an idol. If we don't worship God, then we're worshiping something, something because God has created us to be people of worship. That's who we are. We are created to worship the Lord our God, but if we're not worshiping the Lord our God, then think about then who or what are you worshiping because God has created you as a person of worship. We can worship the things of this world. We can worship money, power, fame, we can worship our favorite ball teams, our favorite uh, actors and actresses. You know, we can worship things of creation. You know, I hear people say, well, I don't go to church because I'm out on Sunday morning communing with nature. Well, that's not what God has intended for us. But this is where, why do we come to worship? Well, we worship God because... God is the creator. We are the stewards. And that we're living in God's creation. And that we're offering to God what he has first given us. There's an old prayer that I think has got so much wisdom and it just really uh, tells it as it is. Heavenly Father, we offer the joy in thanksgiving what you have first given us. Ourselves, our time, in, our, in possession, signs of your gracious love. But we worship the Lord our God, our Creator, because He's the one who restores our life. You know, we come to that conviction that I am a sinner, that I cannot save myself. No matter what I've done in this world, I cannot save myself. I cannot earn my way. I cannot buy my way. I'm not deserving. There's no method. And so when we realize that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself, then we go to confess our sins. We go to the place begging God's mercy. And so we come to worship begging God's mercy. And we must always remember, as I read from John chapter 1, uh, verses, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. And so if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins. And so that's where we come to worship, because we are going to the very place that where we can receive what we are begging for, and that's God's mercy, God's forgiveness, His peace. And then as far as how we respond in our worship, it's how we live our lives day by day. That in all that we do, we love the Lord, that we are honest in our lives, that we show integrity, that we serve, that we sing praises to, that we offer our, our financial gifts to God. We offer ourselves to God, our time and our talents. And that it is the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, who vindicates our life. He's the one who restores because 
You know, who, you know, they, they let the Ark of the Covenant, they bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and into the temple. But I think about Palm Sunday. Jesus, he opened the gate. Jesus came in. And he, as we read in John chapter 2, Jesus did two things. He cleansed the temple because there was so much dishonesty and so much deceit going on in there. But Jesus also says, you know, you can destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. Of course, the people are saying, well, how can you do that? This, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and it still is not made complete. Of course, Jesus is referring to his own person, that he is now the temple. He is the holiness of God. And that you can destroy this temple. He's referring that you can crucify me, but in three days I will be raised from the dead. And that he is the holiness of God, and it's in receiving Jesus that we are forgiven, that it is in receiving Jesus that we are now the temples of the Holy Spirit. But I read then verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. And so what would happen here is that you'd have people outside of the gate and inside of the gate, and they would have an antiph antiphonal response. The priest, with the people outside the gate, would say... Lift up your gates and be lifted up. Open your door. And the people inside would say, well, who is the king of glory? In other words, what's the password? Who is the king that we would open up the door to? And they'd say, the Lord, strong and mighty, he is the king of glory. They'd open up the gate and there would be a processional of the Ark of the Covenant going through. Jesus is the king of glory that entered in on Palm Sunday. But we go to our churches and we pray, saying, open the gate of the church, that the King of glory may come in, that we may come in, that we may receive the righteousness of God, understanding that it is Jesus Christ who opens the gate to eternal life. Jesus is the King of glory who opens the gate of paradise for us, that we all may process in. Well, thank you for joining me. Those who make a donation to KFXB of $25 or more will receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Christmas Ponderings.